Databases, a database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University, is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. So we're super excited today to have Thomas Neumann, the Thomas Neumann, uh, who's a professor at the uh, at TU Munich. Um, he's also the the chief architect of Hyper that was uh, sold by, um, uh, that he sold to, to Tableau. And then he's been working on this new system called Umbra that he's here to talk about uh, uh, for us today. Again, we're super excited to have him here because it's a whole new semester, whole new seminar series. And Thomas was the first person I immediately wanted to get uh, to talk about it because I think this stuff is fantastic. Um, so as always, if you have any questions for Thomas as he's giving his talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are and where you're coming from and feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be a conversation with Thomas and not him talking by himself for an hour. And we thank Thomas for being here and staying up late because it is he is in Germany because uh, he is you know, the best database researcher in Germany. Of course, that's where he is. Uh, and so it's 10 o'clock his time. So we thank him for staying up late. All right, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm uh, happy to talk about our, oops, sorry, uh, about our uh, system. So first, some background why I'm, uh, so what I want to talk about, as Andy said, so about 10 years ago, we started building the uh, hyper system, which eventually went, went commercially. This was a pure in-memory system. And this worked fine, so it has a great performance, everything is, is, is good. But at some point, we realized that being purely in-memory, uh, has some problems. Now we'll talk about the problems in the next slides. But therefore, now the title of this talk here, so the next uh, system, the build the Umbra system, is what we are saying uh, a disk based system. Now, to be honest, it's an SSD based system, but it is a, so a disk based system that aims to provide you the same performance as an in memory system. Okay, now why do we care about this? So if you look about the uh, landscape of potential systems, here you see a sketch that says, okay, if you look, compare uh, the performance and the cost of uh, in-memory systems and disk-based systems, now here talking about classical disk-based systems, we see that in-memory systems are very, very fast, exceptionally fast, much faster than the others, but they're also expensive. Uh, because in uh, main memory is expensive compared to disk. Yeah, there's no question about this. And what worries me even more than just the price is that the size of uh, main memory does not grow up that quickly anymore. Like 10 years ago, there was still a very fast growth of main memory. And we saw that a few years later, everybody would, everybody with the server at least, would have multi terabytes main memory systems. But this didn't happen. I mean, you can buy systems with uh, a few terabytes but they are also quite expensive and memory sizes don't grow significantly any longer. And so this means that we have some kind of limitation for in-memory systems, this made us nervous. Yeah, and, and the second argument of course is simply the cost. Say, so is it cost efficient to put everything in memory? And furthermore, uh, the hardware has changed too. We no longer uh, have just this slow uh, rotating disk. We also have what we hear say uh, as this cloud space SSD based um, uh, systems, uh, sorry, storage devices. And um, you see, they are somewhere in the middle between them. So, first, they are much cheaper than uh, main memory, and they can also be quite fast, not as fast as in as main memory, of course, but you can read uh, several gigabytes per second from an SSD. You know? So, this is, I mean, it's a serious performance, in particular if you think that you can put multiple of these in one machine, and then suddenly we have a read bandwidth that is really uh, uh, something. Yeah? So, you can do something with this systems. And the cost, of course, is much, much lower. Yeah, so we say with the cost of a two terabyte uh, um, main memory, something like $20,000, while on an SSD, it's just 500. Yeah, so this is drastically cheaper. And we can scale, scale this to very large sizes. And if we said, okay, this is an attractive uh, device to use. It has much better latency than a rotating disk and bandwidth is quite good. Uh, okay, but on the other hand, we still have to keep in mind, um, SSDs are fast, but they're still slower than my memory. So if possible, therefore, we would like to operate in memory if we can. And 
in practice, of course, we can, because even though the data set can be large, the working set is usually not that huge. Yeah? So you have reasonable chances that if you have a large server, your working set will often fit in memory. Not always, but often it will fit. And we would like that, at least in the case that uh, the data does fit, uh, the working set does fit in memory, we want to get the same performance as an in-memory system, or nearly the same performance. But if you take a traditional um, architecture, this doesn't happen. Yeah, so if you use a traditional buffer manager, the buffer manager itself imposes overhead on you. And therefore, at some point, your performance is limited by the buffer manager, even though in practice, everything is in my memory. And this, of course, is a bit silly. Yeah, therefore, we want that our system uh, uses a non-traditional buffer manager. And therefore, it gives us, uh, and I will talk about how this works in a moment, and uh, gives us good performance if things fit in memory. Of course, if things don't fit, then we are bound by the IO device. Yeah, that's clear. We can be faster than this. Okay, but uh, now, so this, this is therefore where we place ourselves. So we say we, uh, Umbra systems, so we want to have reasonable costs of being SSD based plus a large memory, but not, not super large memory. And uh, so we combine large in memory buffers with uh, very fast SSD devices. And we also use a different buffer manager architecture, di different in multiple dimensions. And this gives us good performance for a wide uh, range of use cases. So this is basically the story. Okay, and in this uh, talk today, I would like to show you basically what has to be done differently to really be a disk-based system. So you, you don't want to use a traditional disk architecture because this is slow. You cannot just use a pure in-memory architecture either. Yeah? So you have to change things. And I just want to give you a short overview of what we did to, uh, to, to reach this point. Okay, so to, to summarize so this, I hope the only marketing slide that I have. Uh, so we, we said the Umbra system is basically an evolution of Hyper towards an SSD-based system. Uh, so we get comparable performance to Hyper if the working sits, fits in my memory. And if it doesn't fit, then we scale to whatever the IO device gives me. Um, now, many aspects are similar, like as the hyper system, we are compiling queries into uh, uh, executable code, so we are compiling engine and so on. Uh, but I don't want to talk about these parts because they are the same as, as in my previous system. So I only want to talk about today what's different. Yeah, in particular, I want to talk about some key additions and adaptations we did to tackle this uh, thing. And we start here with a buffer manager. So it's a uh, buffer manager that is pretty scalable, so pretty fast, and it's an unusual property. It supports variable sized pages, which usually systems don't. Huh? So usually they have a fixed size, but we built variable sized pages and I will talk about why. And then we have our compilation model is also a bit different than what we did to Hyper. So we have adaptive compilation and we have a, a execution engine that splits this execution plan into modular steps for, for reasons that we talk about. Then uh, we had to do something with statistics maintenance uh, because if your data is on disk, you don't want to look at it with random I.O. because even on SSDs cost you something as yes, you prefer not to. Therefore, our statistics is different and we do strings a bit different. I think it skips the strings, but I will talk about the other three parts. Okay, so let's now start with uh, more uh, technical things. So, what about buffer managers? I, th I think all of you know how buffer managers are implemented. And a traditional buffer manager organizes uh, data in fixed size pages, huh? like 16 kilobytes, 64 kilobytes, or 4 kilobytes, depends on the system. And uh, we do this for good reasons, of course, because the buffer manager is much easier if you have fixed size pages. Yeah? Like uh, recovery is easy, memory management is easy, you have no fragmentation, all pages are the same, so everything works uh, nicely. No? But the price that you pay for this simple buffer manager is that the rest of your system has a terrible complexity. In particular, if you happen to have data structures that are larger than memory. And this can happen quite easily. I mean, the, the, the stupid example for this is if the user inserts a string that is larger than a page, yeah, which can happen. Yeah, user can insert large strings. This compares complex logic. Okay, now you could say how often does this happen, but there are other things that you like to store. For example, uh, dictionaries for dictionary compression. You would like to store them nicely consecutive in memory, but there's a high chance that these are larger than your memory. Uh, sorry, send your page. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so we have, so we need some complex logic that maps these data structures into fixed size pages. So what we call here partitioning logic. So, so this mapping of your data structures to, um, to your page. And this is a problem because this makes your life much more comp complicated and also this costs your performance. If you just think about a lookup in a dictionary for dictionary compression, I think this is the best example. You want that 
resolving one value takes nearly no time. Yeah? So you want to access an array and that's it. Uh, but if you split this into multiple pages, usually logic is much more complex. Yeah, and so you, you, if you use fixed size pages, you get a simple buffer manager, but the rest of your system is complicated because you have to deal all these corner cases. And I think this is a bad trade-off because you implement a buffer manager only once, but you have many uh, data structures in your database system. And that's why I think you don't want this. I think what you want is you want a buffer manager that supports variable size pages. So basically, we want to have a one to one mapping from data structures to my buffer pool. So the data structure is as it is. And if some object is larger than the traditional page size, then it is larger than the traditional page size. You know, so your buffer manager should do the right thing. Yeah, so uh, we, we can handle large objects transparently. And then we can have a nice representation uh, to, to directly access this. Also, perhaps another motivation why we why we prefer this. Remember, we want to have the same performance as an in-memory system. And of course, our in-memory system that we compare against our own had objects that were larger than the page and needed immediate access. And so therefore, if you want to beat this system, this is of course what we want to do, we have to have a similar lookup performance, basically. Now, so therefore, we said, okay, we want to support these structures. Good thing is, if you do this, you need no complex partitioning logic, everything's easy. Bad thing is, buffer manager is complicated. Yeah, but as I said, said I think this is a worthwhile trade off because you implement the buffer manager only once and then the rest is, is okay. Yeah, so, of course, it is more complicated. Now, uh, the most uh, difficult problem actually of the, the buffer manager is fragmentation or the most severe problem because if you have uh, data objects with different sizes and you allocate and release them in other order, you can get holes that are difficult to fill. Yeah, so that we uh, call external fragmentation. And um, so how do we get rid of the holes that we have in our buffer? So otherwise it can happen that numerically we still have space, but in practice uh, the old space is unusable. Okay, and we solve this problem by using a, a, a trick here. Basically, we distinguish between virtual and physical memory. Because in the end, the physical amount of memory that you have in your system is limited to yeah, whatever your memory is. Yeah? So you have, if, let's say, uh, 512 gigabyte or something, or 256 gigabytes. This is your space that you could use. Um, but in the on the physical level, but on the virtual levels in the virtual address space, we have much more space available. Yeah? So operating system will happily give us more as long as we don't allocate it all. And therefore, we allocate this memory that we have available repeatedly, so multiple times, with different size classes. So here you see a small sketch that says, okay, let's allocate the same memory ra range with 64 kilobytes, 128 kilobytes, 256, and 512. Of course, you need exponential growth to, to limit uh, the number of entries that you have. Okay, but the total amount of pages that we need is just double if you use a uh, uh, power of two growth. Huh? So we, we don't need a lot of extra, but now this gives us basically the whole space with multiple uh, granularities. And now if I need uh, memory on a certain size class, so let's say I have uh, space available here immediately for uh, for small pages, but now I need uh, a large page and I don't have it consecutive, then what I can do is I uh, deallocate two small pages. So this takes operating system to uh, cut the link between the virtual address space and the physical address space. You, so you un unmap the six, two kilo, 64 kilobyte pages, and then you have space, physical space available again for 128 kilobytes. And then you can touch this block here to the left and then you get it and then everything works. Okay, so basically you tell the operating system to, um, to um, give me this, the same physical memory and a different virtual address, and then you don't have the fragmentation problem. Okay, so your fragmentation is fixed because we migrate to a different address in a uh, virtual address. Okay, and uh, so the, therefore the mapping between uh, virtual address and physical address is only guaranteed for pinned buffer pages. So if somebody accesses a buffer page, then we guarantee this, otherwise we can remove this. Okay. So this was a, a memory allocation. Now, um, this while this is handy, so this allows me to store uh, complicated things in my buffer, this alone is not sufficient to get good performance. Remember, our opponent here is a pure in-memory system. And um, like the traditional implementation here would be like we uh, acquire a latch or so a read writer log basically for every page that we access, we pin this, unpin this. Uh, this is uh, terribly expensive and because every access grabs a log. 
And uh, even even worse, if you think about the B tree, the root is highly contented, as the lock on the root is highly contented. Uh, so we don't like this. Therefore, we use two tricks here to improve performance of this buffer manager. First is pointer swizzling, and second is versioned ledges. Uh, so we don't use traditional ledges, we use the versioned ledges. Okay, now how do these uh, techniques work? Um, so pointer swizzling. Tom, 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 can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry, I, I guess my mic wasn't working. I have questions from, from the audience. So someone oh, is it, I so don't ben see the question. I'll, I'll read you. So Ben, ben okay. okay, Ben, you want to mute yourself and go for it? Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Are there any issues with changing the virtual to physical mapping uh, very often where you can increase the size of kernel data structures or blow out the TLB cache? Um, I've heard of using mremap to like do a fast realloc. This kind of trick can cause other memory accesses to be slower. Yes, uh, so th therefore we don't use uh, MRE map because this is indeed a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we just tell the operating system to unlink it. So this is uh, image wise don't need, I think. Uh, so then uh, to tell the operating system to forget this. So this uh, leaves uh, the mapping simple. So it's still a linear mapping as a kernel. So address space does, uh, so you don't get crazy mapping objects. Uh, the mapping is still linear. Now there is still a cost, namely if you change the size, then you have to shoot down the TLB of the other cores. And therefore, you don't like to do this very often. Yeah, so we actually, we prefer to keep uh, memory in a certain size, and we only move it to a different size if you have to. Because you are right, uh, so the, the, there is a cost associated with this. Um, and now there are some, some tricks you can play uh, in the kernel to make this cheaper, uh, but so I, there's a, a Professor from a database uh, chairs that told me how you can improve the performance, but this requires patching the kernel and we don't do this by default. And so, uh, so by default, we just use vanilla uh, kernel calls, and then we prefer not to change um, uh, the size if you can. But it's, it's not terribly expensive. You can't do this a few hundred times a second, that's okay. But you don't want to do this millions of times. All right, next question is from Nevin. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm wondering how do you how does the flush work with uh, variable page sizes? Is it backed by a file? Oh, uh, Nevin from Google BigQuery. Hello. Uh, so you mean how to write it to disk? Is this a, is right? It, right? Right? It doesn't work that different from from a regular write out. You do, do the same. The only thing is you have to be a bit careful with recovery. Yeah, you also on the physical storage you don't want to change the size. Uh, of the page because otherwise it could happen that a large page is uh, overwritten by you no know, what's the wrong direction no uh, better as the direction two small pages and you overwrite it with a large page this is unsafe because then you are not sure that the header with the lsn number is in the correct place as you have to be a bit careful with uh, with uh, uh, with aliasing uh, so that uh, for, to guarantee the recovery works but otherwise you just treat it as a regular page you 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 write it to your file and then that's it. So our like 64 KIB, is that like a page? It's it, like in itself? Yes. Okay, cool. So you just write a 64 kilobyte page. Got it, thank you. Yeah. All right. Or, 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 or larger if, if you look. So basically you are, uh, my, our, our page is, is a combination of physical offset and, and the size class encoded in the page ID. And so we must know how large each page is, of course. And then we can uh, read and write it. All right, Todd, do you want to ask your question? Uh, no, a quick further question with that. Do you use a no huge page for your mapping so that when you actually want to unmap a 64K slot, it can actually be remapped elsewhere? So if you're using two megabyte yeah. pages and you end up having to do page splitting on that unmap, can you do that? No, we, we, don't, we don't want uh, transparent huge pages on this. Okay. Uh, so you just pay the extra TLV pressure yes. because you get finer granularity. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, as I said, I think you could you could improve the efficiency of this even with, with some kernel changes, <laughs> and, and and some people did this, but this is not uh, not something that we uh, that mainline kernel currently offers you. So currently we just use a regular. And so basic, basically, our trick is we try to change the size as rarely as we can, yeah, because changing sizes in, has increases cost. All right, awesome. Keep going. Okay. And uh, yeah, so we said, we, uh, I was here, so I said, um, so the, do we want to keep the, uh, the cost of accessing a page down? Yeah, because if you do the, tradi the traditional solution is you use, use a hash table, and then you acquire a log for the hash table, and then you look up the page, and then acquire a lateral page, and it's all terribly expensive. Yeah, so therefore, what we, uh, to, to 
get the in-memory performance, we use pointers visiting. So basically, if with on the page, you have a, a page ID, so we call this here SWIP, you know, so a potentially swizzled pointer. So this, this SWIP is either a page ID if the page is not in memory, or if it is in memory, it's really physically pointing to the page that we have. And therefore, if you now follow um, a page ID on a, um, uh, from a page, we check, did we already resolve this? And if yes, we just jump there. So it's one if, and then you go to the page that you have to access. And uh, if not, then of course we uh, have to acquire a log and do something, but we do IO anyway. So if it's not in memory, we do IO, and then we can pay some price yeah, because this costs you something. But if the page was already in memory, then we can just follow the, or if we already traversed this pointer before, then we can just follow the pointer and uh, that's it. Of course, uh, the price that you pay for this is that when you uh, evict a page, you must invalidate the incoming SWIP. Right? Because otherwise somebody would think that the page is there, but it's not. Yes, yeah, so you must invalidate the SWIP. And uh, at least our current implementation therefore allows you to have only one incoming SWIP. Uh, this is some, has some consequences. Basically, your data structures must all be trees, yeah? because then we, if you have a tree, then everything's fine. Yeah? But if you have not a tree, then we, uh, now, now there's no strong reason to not have two. We could have two or so, but you want to have a low number of incoming SWIFs uh, to, um, because we must invalidate them when, um, when uh, we evict the page. Okay? Uh, yeah, but otherwise, this PIP here encodes our, uh, our address, and then we can. Uh, very, very cheaply access a, a page without having a hash table lookup. Okay, and um, a, a second thing that we use to get a good performance is we use a different kind of synchronization. Of course, in a disk-based system, you need some way to synchronize uh, because the, the page can go away because due to memory pressure, uh, so the page can go away. And so we need some mechanism to synchronize, but we don't like this. Uh, just think about the, the worst, worst offender is the, the root of a B tree. Whenever you do a lookup, everybody goes through the root. Yeah, and the traditional solution would be, okay, you grab a read writer lock, so a latch on the root, find where you have to go, really uh, latch the child, release the root, and that's it. But if the data is in practice in memory, all your time will be spent on acquiring the stupid uh, mutex, in particular the mutex on the root of the uh, B tree. That's highly, highly contended even though everybody's only reading. Yeah, because acquiring a mutex is an implicit write, even if there's no, no logical contention. Yeah, therefore, we don't want this. So what we do instead is we use a, what you call here a version ledge is just one 60-bit integer counter. And this can be locked in different modes. Basically, you can, uh, the easiest mode is of course just exclusive lock, yeah, as, you, as you would expect. You can also have a shared lock. Yeah, so like remember how many readers we have. And the third mode is we can get this in an optimistic lock. And um, so this is, so what does optimistic lock mean? So in this, um, in this version ledge, we remember um, how many exclusive unlocks we did. So basically, whenever you do an exclusive, an unlock of an exclusive mode, you bump a, a version number. Okay, so you, you, this allows you to realize if there was a change. And this allows you, means that we can optimistically reach a page without doing anything. Yes, yeah, so we go to the page, read this version lock. In this moment, we know if somebody got an exclusive lock. And if yes, of course, then we we have to wait until this one goes away. But if nobody has an exclusive lock, we just read the page as it is and no locking at all, optimistically. But the problem is before we can act on what we have read, because this can change at any point in time, of course. Yeah, so if before we can act upon what is read, we read this version lock again and check if, if this if has changed. And if, if not, we are say, okay, we are safe. We safely read something. Otherwise we had to race and then we start again. Okay, and uh, so th and this this optimistic mode here means um, we do not write to memory at all. Yeah, so we, we only read, and this scales beautifully even with uh, dozens of cores or uh, hundreds of cores even. Yeah, so it's, it's extremely fast, scales very well. Of course, we we may fail if we have contention, but it's uh, usually not the case. Yeah, so we rarely have these things, and of course we have these other modes: read um, shared for read only and uh, exclusive for read write. Uh, now, the, the crazy thing is, if you are an optimistically latched a page, the page might in fact go away while you're reading. But this works because the way we implemented our buffer manager, if a page is evicted, we read the zero page. 
and therefore you're just reading zeros. Of course, this is garbage. If you're a reader, must be a bit careful. You must be, you must cope with the fact that you might read garbage. But we realize this afterwards, and then everything works fine. Yeah, this, this gives you extremely good scalability uh, across course. Okay, and uh, now uh, how do we use this to implement a traditional database? Basically, our relations are stored in B plus trees. And uh, now the, the key of the B plus tree is, is just a synthetic tuple ID. Yeah, so it's not visible to the user. Internally, we uh, organize this by a tuple ID and as keys. And then uh, yeah, here we said we have a packs layout within the leaf pages. Technically speaking, we also have a pure column store layout. But so this is a, the, 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 the OLTB oriented layout, if you wish. So we have a packs layout within the, the leaf page. And then we, um, uh, we can scan this reasonably well and we can, we can, we can navigate in this to our tuples that we need. And you have only one incoming pointer for a page. Okay, and we use different access modes depending on what you're doing. So uh, if you um, have uh, um, uh, 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 just a traversal, like you do point lookup, or you go over the root of the this P tree, then we use optimistic uh, uh, locking because we don't modify anything. Yes, yeah? so we just read and go to the next page. And uh, now, if you read a leaf page, then what we do depends on our, our mode. And uh, if you just do a one Tuple access, point access, then we use also optimistic locking. If we use a scan, then we use a shared uh, latch. So then, then we grab a real uh, shared mode. Now, why do we do this? Uh, why do we do a, use, not always use optimistic locking? Now, the problem with optimistic locking is you must validate after every read. In particular, um, what about strings? Yeah, because strings can go, a page can go away at any point in time. If you use a point access, we just copy the string and check afterwards if it was still valid. But if you do not want to do this during scans, therefore we uh, latch the page until we are done, and then nobody evicts it until we are done. This allows us to avoid copying strings. Okay, um, now there are also some other difficulties that we had, of course. Yeah, what about multi versioning? Yeah, of course, we want to have multi versioning because um, we, yeah, we want uh, transaction isolation and so on. And, um, but multi versioning is a bit unpleasant. It's a complex data structure, and we have to update this. And we, um, we, uh, we after a transaction commits, so you don't like to write it to disk. So, so we therefore we prefer not to write it to disk because of the high overhead. And therefore, actually, we used a mixed solution for this. Uh, so first, so in the regular case, for most transactions, we just use an in-memory representation of, uh, of the transaction. And the argument is that most transactions are small. Yeah, so if you just touch a few hundred tuples, it just happily keeps its memory. And so we have a, here the transaction version buffer that tells me, okay, I'll change my transaction. And then we attach these version buffers to pages. So basically, we have a mapping table that tells me, okay, for this page, this is the corresponding version buffers. And then we uh, we can look up in the page, but for performance reasons, we store it in the buffer frame. So when you load a page, basically we check is there a, a, a corresponding buffer, then we attach it to the page directly with the pointer, then we can go to this. And if we evict a page, we keep this version buffers around. So here's what we call here orphans. And then we come to the page, comes back again, we reattach it and that's it. Okay, uh, so this gives me very fast access to this version buffer. This works beautifully if your transaction is small, but of course it could be that your transaction is large. It's not often the case, but somebody can do a bulk load or does a delete from relation or some other heavy thing. So we could, you could touch every tuple in the database. And then of course we don't want to have an in-memory uh, representation like this because it would be very expensive. Okay, and therefore, if we do have a bulk operation, we, we notice that you do this, then we do something else. And our, our for reason here said, Reasoning is that, of course, bike operations can happen, but they're not very frequent. So nobody has a high frequent bike operation. At least if they do, then they have a performance problem. So we say they, are, they happen from time to time, but not all the time. And therefore, we say we allow that at most one bike operation is active for a given relation at a certain point in time. So of course, there can be another one afterwards, but we have only one running one. And then uh, for these bike operations, we store um, um, versioning information just as bits that we directly materialize on the page. So we basically say for, uh, on a page, we remember to which bike operation it belongs. So we see an epoch number on the page. And then we just store a created and deleted bit for the tablet if he needs this for the bike operation. Okay, and the advantage of this, this mini versions, just two bits, that we can write this to disk. So now we can handle outer really large updates. You, can, don't, you cannot have more than one concurrently, but uh, you can each individually can be out really large. Okay, and this allows us then to isolate uh, also this uh, heavy operations properly with multi-versioning. 
Okay, what's my time? Oh yeah, sorry, 50 minutes. Oh, I think I have, might have to, uh, let's, let's see. You're doing, you're doing great, keep going. Okay, yeah. So, and then uh, a few other things that you have to do differently because of the disk-based systems. Because in Hyper, we just built a, a sample of our, so the first, um, what the back, we need statistics. Yeah, we need statistics all the time for estimation purposes. Like our query optimizer needs statistics, and we we have to know how many tuples qualify for a predicate, how many distinct values do you have for a group by, and all the stuff. And uh, Hyper used a sample for this, and and, and when data changed too much, we just recomputed the sample. So this is what we did in memory. But on disk, you don't want to do this because random access to tuples is problematic. On a rotating disk, it's a disaster. On an SSD, it's okay-ish, but you still get re read amplification because you just might just need one tuple from a page, but you read the whole page. And so, so re retrieving a large sample from disk is expensive, even on SSDs. Yeah, therefore we don't want to do this. And we don't want to compute samples on demand. What we do instead is we use reservoir sampling. So basically, while, while you insert data or while update or delete data, we maintain a sample for you all the time. So the sample is always available. We don't have to recompute it. And when you insert, we do use this, um, um, uh, Vita, I think, uh, algorithm to predict the, the skip length between hits and the reservoir sample. And then we, uh, so most of the time we do nothing and we just, we, we figure out which tuple would be relevant for the sample and then we insert it in our sample. Okay, one difficulty here is do how to do this multi-threading uh, because it's uh, multi-threaded insert and you, I hope you see a small sketch here on top. I'm not sure if it's understandable, but basically, we have the skips between tuples that we can pre-compute and we hand the skips to, to threads basically. We said, okay, you are responsible to skipping so many tuples until once qualifies. And we give this out to, to, uh, to threads on demand. Note that the length of the skip increases over time yeah? so because the, the larger the race becomes more, more unlikely, it becomes that the tuple is relevant. We hand out the skips and each thread, thread local counts down until a relevant tuple would be encountered. And this uh, is very cheap, very low overhead. And only when a tuple is relevant for the sample, then we insert it into a proper synchronized data structure. Okay, so this allows us to maintain the sample with very little cost all the time. And uh, now samples are great if you just want to ha handle a predicate. It does not work well for estimating these distinct counts, like group by sizes, for example, unfortunately. Yeah? And um, if we, to solve this, we maintain another data structure also while inserting, namely hyperlock lock sketches. Yeah? So for all, tuple, for all columns in our um, relations, we maintain hyperlock lock sketches when you insert, and then we can give you a pretty good estimate for the number of distinct values for all columns without reading afterwards, because you don't want to read afterwards. I know uh, systems try to solve this IO cost problem by re by sampling not tuples, but pages, but don't do this. Yes, you get statistical bias if you do this and um, uh, rather prefer a proper statistical solution, like, for example, RISP or something. Okay, okay, if you, uh, uh, more words about what else we changed. Now our um, uh, compilation model was a bit, a bit different what we did in Hyper and Hyper. We just took the query, compiled it into a function, then you call the function, that's it. Yeah, but this is unpleasant because in the IO case, you might want to um, uh, deschedule your query. You might want to pause your query. And, and if your query is just a function that you call, it's quite difficult. You don't get rid of this function that is currently executing. Yeah? Therefore, what we do instead is we compile our query into a state machine, basically. Now here you see a small sketch. I hope it's understandable. So we say we have a small query says we, we are reading supplier group by nation key and then we perform a count. And if we say this results in two pipelines, one is scanning of supplier and the aggregation. The second pipeline is reading the result and then producing the result. And we on the right hand side, you see is a small state machine here. In this case, it's just a simple uh, from, from uh, bottom to top, just hop one level up. As we set up uh, pipeline one, we create thread local storage, and then we do uh, uh, thread local aggregation. Now, in, in parallel, you know, notice this bar around the box. So this is now multi threaded. Then we allocate a global hash table, merge the, again, parallel merges in the global hash table, and so on. And so, this is how we execute the query. And uh, at any point in time, you can stop this and then resume the state machine whenever you are. And this is, was was uh, quite handy um, for, a, uh, for for handling IO and also for handling long running queries. Like you don't want that your long running query uh, kicks out all your short queries. So like somebody might run a very cheap query and you don't want him to wait until the long running query is gone. So we use this for both for scheduling and for IO handling. Uh, so this mechanism. Did you get, I mean, is this implemented as like coroutines or is this like little, little functions that 
this is this is uh, is not a, it behaves a bit like a coroutine, but from a technical perspective, it's just functions with state. Yeah, but this is generated anyway. You know, so that's, uh, but it is looks a bit like a coroutine, but from a technical perspective, it's a regular function with explicit state. So we we, we keep track of the state. Got it. Did you consider okay. like like the I'm thinking of like the the, the SQL SQL OS stuff where like they have these little little little, little functions that like they're like at most six milliseconds and they always come back and you, you can decide a year or two. Like they basically implement their own coroutines themselves. Is, is that sort of the way I should think about that? Yes. Uh, so we we might could have used, for example, C plus plus coroutines to uh, do this. Uh, we intentionally did not because uh, the, uh, we looked at this problem is the C plus plus coroutines uh, does memory allocation for its own state, and we don't mm -hmm. want this. We want to control memory, and therefore okay. we uh, we uh, create this automatically ourselves. But but note that our query uh, compiler is a really compiler anyway. So in a way, we are generating a coroutine, if you wish. It's just yeah. it's uh, it's uh, it's all generated anyway. Yes, awesome. Thanks. Okay, and yeah, so the uh, the uh, nice thing about this modular architecture is that we can easily suspend it and we can uh, fine grained uh, things. Okay, now. Um, also, what the steps allow us is that we don't have to compile everything at once, but we can compile pieces of the query individually. Like each step can be uh, is a function. Uh, therefore, we can compile each function individually. And so, what we do is we we first we lower our code into a custom intermediate representation that looks a bit like LVM. Uh, it's not the same, but it looks a bit like this. And then when we have this, we can lower this with different backends. You know, like our our when we run a query, we first translate it into using a very low latency backend. So it's very cheap to compile. And then we start it. And then we see how expensive this step is. Because a step like uh, allocate a hash table, I mean, come on, this needs very few instructions. There's no point in optimizing this. Yeah, And uh, um, only when we see that, okay, this step is expensive, then we start a more heavyweight uh, uh, step. And note that users while the query is still running. So we don't stop the query for this. We compile in the background and then we switch while it's executing. And uh, so, a comp in, in, in fact, compile time in a, in a compiling engine, compile time becomes a problem because we started using LVM, always using LVM. But this has problems because LVM has super linear compile time, unfortunately, because they are. I spoke to some of these, these developers and I said, hey, your compile time is super linear if the function is large. And they said, okay, don't, don't make large functions. And I said, hey, excuse me, it's machine generated. I cannot, uh, yeah. Okay, so they don't uh, have sympathy for our problems. Okay, so and therefore we, we, we do something else. So we start with directly emitting machine code. So we did ourselves so we have our own machine code emitter. And, um, so, and the difficult thing is actually not generating machine codes relatively easy. Difficult thing is register allocation. And this requires you to detect loops and uh, lifetime computation. So this is uh, bad things. And unfortunately, you need some pretty advanced algorithm for this. Fortunately, Tajan uh, described how to do this. Uh, so you can steal them all from the literature. But these are pretty advanced things. But it's a good thing. If you implement them, then you get guaranteed almost linear compile time. You know, almost linear means in practice linear. This inverse Ackermann function is, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, less than six. So this is linear in practice. And uh, so then uh, you get um, very, very good compile time. Yeah, so, you know, you see compile time compressions. Note that the scales are very different in these uh, three cases. Yeah, we, one is, yes, is if you compile a query with uh, between zero and no, between, yeah, zero and 2,000 uh, joins, in LVM, compile time goes up to 150 seconds. If you do this, you force LVM to do, say, OK, do it as cheaply as you can. You still need four seconds. And if you use our own emitter here, we need, I uh, don't know, 35 milliseconds or so. Uh, so this is uh, much faster than what the others are doing. Yes. I should understand. Like, so like, you're, you're not generating LVM, right? you're generating your own bytecodes. Um, and then you, you're emitting assembly, and you're running the assembler, or you're still running LLVM? Uh, no, we have different. So we, after we generated this IR, we have different choices. We have what we call a backend. So basically, we can lower our own intermediate representations into different backends. One is a backend that directly emits machine code. Mm -hmm. And note that we skip the assembler. So we really emit machine code. So a byte, okay. byte, byte stream. Yeah. Uh, so a machine code. This is one. This is super low latency, uh, uh, but it has, and also, 
quite okay performance, but it's not as fast as the code that uh, LVM generates with O3. Yeah? So this gives better code. Uh, so because you have a trade-off here between how much time you spend on compiling and execution speed. And uh, so therefore, if you realize that this query part is really quite a lot, then we start uh, LVM, uh, an LVM backend. So we lower our own representation to LVM and then compile it there. And then, but only if you think it's worthwhile. And in most parts of security, it's not worthwhile. Yeah, because there's a trade-off here because it's between execution speed and compile time. And so we only do this if, if you would benefit from this. Hi, Nevin, you want to ask your question? Hi, so I'm a huge fan of, you know, vectorized uh, runtimes. So I'm just wondering, uh, would a vectorized runtime do any better uh, within this context? So from uh, my understanding, we're trying to optimize for like, uh, like IO stalls in our uh, query plan. Uh, so if we had a vectorized engine, would that be in some sense easier or better to use um, in this context? Uh, yeah. I think for IO, it's not a super large, perhaps it's a bit, a bit easier because you can predict what will happen next. But but note that the re one reason why we uh, you want to compile instead of just vectorizing is you also want to run OLTP workloads. And if you have OLTP workloads, then uh, compiled uh, engines are really significantly faster than uh, vectorized. Vectorized is fine if you're on OLAP. So you can build a beautiful OLAP system with vectorized, no, no problem. But if you try to run OLTP workloads, uh, then this is a vectorization overhead it becomes noticeable because often you touch only a handful of tuples and then uh, you don't want to uh, pay the price for a vectorized execution. And, right. and, and, and even though I said here, we, are, we, we want to handle the disk case reason well, we still assume that most of the time we will be in my memory. So we assume that IO is an outlier. IO must work, IO must give good performance, but we still optimize for the in-memory case. And then right. Have... And so you do like uh, caching the query plan to avoid recompiling, right? <laughs> Actually, compile time is so low that we no longer do this. We, we did this at a certain point, yes. But, uh, but really, we can we, we mean, see, we need 33 uh, 5 milliseconds for a query with 2,000 joints. Very few queries have 2,000 joints. Uh, so compile time is not a serious problem for us. So for this reason, actually, we stopped caching plans. Fascinating. Thank you. Okay, so I'm um, nearly out of time, but uh, just a few uh, numbers to, uh, to, to, to show you. This is just a comparison between uh, Umba and uh, Hyper, so our own system, and uh, Monet. And uh, this left one here is joint order benchmark. We see that on average, we're about uh, three times faster than Hyper and uh, four times than Monet. And if you compare 2BCH, then we see on average, we are 1.7 faster than Hyper and uh, yeah, uh, 1.9 than uh, Monet, so, but with, with a error bus. Note, but of course, as a full disclosure, uh, the reason why we win over Hyper is not because our runtime system is faster. It's perhaps a bit faster, but the real reason is we win is we have better statistics. We generate better plans. Hyper is a very fast system. So if, if data fits in memory, it gives excellent performance. But uh, we did also a lot on the optimizer. And we, in fact, we happen to construct better plans. Uh, so this is, uh, therefore, the, the numbers here are not so over interpreted. It's, it's not easy to compare systems. The, uh, here, basically, I just want to show you that we get basically the same performance as an in-memory system. Uh, so if we if, know that this is now measured in memory, indeed, one cache. So this is in memory. And there, there we get the performance of an in memory system. This was our goal. Now, uh, what about if the data does not fit in memory? Yeah? So it's easy to figure where we are. So how fast are we? Uh, did we reach the, the bandwidth basically that we could get? And we did a comparison is with uh, uh, with an MAP system just to see what overhead we have. And if you have if you run a single threaded, then we see that we get basically the same performance as an MAP. And average, we are paying something like six percent uh, slowdown in, in single threaded. And if we if, uh, if we um, measure the code cache case, then we get basically the full read bandwidth of an FSD in both cases. Um, if you use just a handful of threads. Note that in practice, MAP, even though here it looks good, is not a viable option. MAP is a terrible choice. Andy has uh, written extensively on this, but uh, MAP is a terrible choice. In particular, if you run the same experiment here, not with uh, 16 threads, but with 200 threads, performance is awful. Uh, 
Yeah, because they are all fighting for logs in the kernel. Performance is terrible. Yeah, so you cannot use MAP for um, highly parallel reads. So it doesn't really doesn't work. So here, yeah, I just want to show you that in the in the end, we reach the performance of the I/O device if uh, if we are in the out of uh, memory scenario. Okay, so to conclude, I hope I could give you at least some ideas that uh, Umber tries to offer the best of both worlds. So we say we achieve the performance of an in-memory system if the data fits in my memory, and we, yeah, as, as scalable as a disk-based system if we go beyond memory, if we have to. And yeah, so some key things that we had to achieve this, yeah, one is, of course, our buffer manager, and uh, second is uh, our execution plan model and this uh, adaptive ex execution compilation framework. And finally, we did a lot on uh, work on getting statistics and string handling reasonable, even if um, data is, is beyond memory. Okay, thanks for your time. Okay, awesome. I, I will applaud on behalf of whatever else. Uh, you know, I told Thomas he had 45 minutes, and he's on 45 minutes on the dot. I mean, it's yeah. very German of you. Uh, so we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so the audience, please, please unmute yourself and go for it. Um, all right, Todd, go for it. Hi, uh, I had a question about the buffer manager and your Btree implementation. Um, do you use a fixed page size for the internal and leaf nodes or a fixed uh, tuple count? And do you try to target being just under a size that's a power of two in order to reduce internal fragmentation? Or how do you sort of manage those trade-offs? Yeah, so the, uh, in fact, we have in the, in the B-tree, do you have a nice picture of the B-tree? No, uh, I'm sorry. I should have had a picture of the B-tree. Uh, in the, uh, the B-tree, in the leaf page, we try to reach uh, 64 kilobytes uh, sizes. So this is our preferred page size. And we fill it up to 64 kilobytes. Now, if you give me a tuple that is larger than 64 kilobytes, then of course I will use a larger page because there's no choice. And so if you, you can insert a string with two gigabytes if you want, and then you get a two gigabyte page. Uh, but um, uh, we, we prefer 64 kilobyte pages on, on the leaf level. On the inner nodes, we will always get 64 kilobyte pages because our keys are tabular IDs and we can guarantee that this uh, we never. So the inner pages are in fact fixed size, but leaf pages are 64 kilobytes if you can get away and otherwise as large as we have to uh, for your for your, for your tuples. Okay, and under full pages are still 64K. You don't use the smaller size classes for a... No, but under under full uh, and it's not very likely that you get under full pages because we, we fit now, well, perhaps if and deletions, you do the merges on deletion or we we have we merge on delete, yeah. Yeah, so uh, if, uh, of course, if you all your tablets have, uh, have 30, 33 kilobytes or so, then we get unavailable pages. But uh, but otherwise, we we put uh, tablets on the, on there as we, as much as we can. And so we, we fill the page with tablets. Okay, and then on the interaction for using tuples, just um, via pointers like that, to use any prefetching tricks or anything, or just take the cache misses as you're traversing and binary searching. Uh, currently, we uh, no we. Um, this actually, logic is not so not so simple. Um, I, as, 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 if I remember correctly, the code the uh, first time you go down, you just go down and take the cache. But if you do multiple lookups, we remember where we have to go next or expect to go next, and then prefetch this, and then uh, so that the, the next page that we will access is is uh, cheaper to access. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yeah. Okay. Thanks. Chi, uh, question, go for it. Yeah, so I have a question about the uh, query execution. I'd like to know if you have a fixed number of threads running the queries or you will allocate new threads when there are more queries um, coming in the process. We have a fixed number of threads. Uh, note that uh, we have always as many threads as you have cores. Because uh, I think it, it makes no sense to have more uh, threads and cores because clearly they cannot run uh, concurrently. So we have uh, exactly as many threads as we have uh, cores, and then mm -hmm. we schedule queries to uh, to uh, threads basically. As we have a scheduler that decides which thread works on which query, and then you we hand out this mm -hmm. as uh, yeah. And if you have one only one query, of course you get all cores. But if you have mm -hmm. multiple queries, you yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. And then comes my next question. So you, if you have a fixed number of threads, then there are some OLAP queries. They might be taking the CPU cores for a long time, and then there will be some TP queries. Um, so how do you decide um, the scheduling of these queries so that TP queries have low latency and AP queries can still execute fast? 
Yeah, we, we use a decaying priority, which means uh, the longer the query runs, the, mm -hmm. uh, le uh, the less, no, it gets all the threads if, if they're available, but the less mm -hmm. its priority is. So therefore, if a new query comes and mm -hmm. uh, then it will kick out, the, uh, it will take course away from the uh, from the OLAP queries. Mm -hmm. And then so to get the OTP queries through. Yeah, so um, when can you kick out the query? Do you place uh, some explicit L point in those state machines or you just uh, randomly uh, stop some threads? Um, so the, uh, basically when we, I didn't want to overload my slides too much. There's already too much on the slides. But, um, so, so if if you if you look about these multi-threaded steps, so these are internally using a morsel-driven parallelism, which means they they are processing a few thousand tuples and then they fall back to a small as a kind of a scheduling function. And mm -hmm. most of the time, of course, you just pick the next morsel and that's it. But if somebody decides that your thread now should yield, then mm -hmm. at the next morsel boundary, you stop processing and then uh, you switch to another query. Uh, so you have to wait at most, yeah, uh, actually it's very precise. Actually, it's, it, it, in a way, aims for, for time. Yeah? So but we, we try to pick the most size so that they have all the same execution time. So, but usually you have to wait, let's say 500 tuples and then you, you, you get a call. Yeah, thank you. You said you I, use I, only I, one thread per core. Um, does that mean that none of these threads ever block on IO? How do you keep the CPU yes. saturated? Uh, yeah, so uh, 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 this is indeed a, a, a thing. So ex with this part, we are not 100% happy yet. So what we what we started with was just saying, hey, we're using very fast uh, NVMe SSDs. And the uh, unlikely event that you block an O, then you block an O. Yeah, so because these have pretty low latency, so you can synchronous block. But if your device is not an, an very fast NVMe SSD, as we learned uh, painfully, <laughs> then you don't want to do this. So then you need another thread, but this does prefetching and then hands out loaded pages for, uh, for the workers. So basically, the, but the workers should never block for a long time. And so if your IO device is very fast, you can synchronously block, but if it's slow, then you have, have to have somebody else to do the IO for you and just wake you up when, uh, when work is there. All right, uh, Jason, question. Uh, it was uh, along those lines, uh, if you're using the NVMe uh, PCI Express uh, SSDs, could you redirect the IO to, to those threads that are running on the cores that are directly attached to those particular PCIe slots? Oh, that's a good idea, actually. We did. Uh, we uh, we didn't implement this. We did something similar in 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 the hyper system where we uh, prefer to read memory from the local NUMA node. Now we we scheduled threads so that you prefer to read from a local node. We could do the same, of course, for for this, but we haven't implemented this. But it's a good idea. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, Sylvia. Uh, I was wondering, what's the like? How does the database like? know whether to use LLVM or flying start to compile query plan because like is there some statistics to help like predict like how would be the speed up uh, of the optimized LLVM like before compiling yes. or, yeah okay so basically what we're doing is within each pipeline we keep track of the progress yeah, so we, we the, uh, the, the, the driver, for, for example, the scan for supplier uh, must tell us which fraction of supplier have you read, at least an estimate for this. So we, so we know how fast we, uh, how far we are, and this allows us to predict how long we will need to finish. And then we have a model that first uh, models compile time of LVM. So we have a, uh, we from the, we, we have a, um, basically a polynomial function for the, that gives tells us how expensive it is to compile this. And then also the expected speed up on LVM, of course, there's, it was measured, but of course there's some inaccuracy there, but we have a model that tells us how much faster we will be if we do this. And then if it's worthwhile, then we start um, um, the compilation and switch. And if you say, no, it's the running time, remaining running time is not significant enough, then we never. So then we start, stop this, with our flank start began. Oh, that's pretty cool, thanks. I mean, this is roughly the tech, the adaptive execution stuff you were doing with Hyper, right? In the ICD paper. 
this is an extension. Yeah, the, 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 the hyper had already, but in hyper was different, a bit different. Then we just switched between um, a uh, virtual machine or two LVM nodes. But uh, yes. we, we stopped doing this. We now have a different start. Uh, so our, our uh, initial backend is different than what we did in hyper. I understand. Yeah, I understand. OK, cool. Uh, Gavin. This, hi. This might be a dumb question, but I'm, I'm curious if you have like async IO enabled abilities with like IO U ring or the new uh, Windows IO ring stuff, does that impact your ability to um, kind of schedule things and do async work? So in fact, we use uh, this for this um, uh, this background thread that does IO. This does use IO U ring to, to schedule IO. And then when the page is there, then we can uh, hand this to the worker threads. Oh, super cool, thank you. All right, Todd, go for it. Uh, I had a quick question switching gears a little bit to the packs encoding that you use on leaf pages. I'm curious if you, how you sort of navigate the tension between dense encodings and low runtime CPU overhead on decoding those encodings. Do you find yourself using very lightweight ones or denser but heavy to decode? Or do you uh, catch things in a decoded format in memory at any point? Note that uh, this, this pack layout is optimized really for an OLTP workload. Uh, so therefore, uh, updates and so much, everything has to be cheap. Uh, so this basically uh, is uh, is not uh, compressed or, or uh, of course, oh, okay. the, the pack layout is, is allows you to do cheap scans. So it's it's not it's not a, a, a row layout. It does allow provide for cheap scans, but nevertheless, it's not heavily compressed or anything like this. Okay, you're not using any run length coding or anything on within the packs page. We have a different backend for OLAP queries. There we do this, but not on not for uh, OTP, no. Gotcha, okay, thanks. And then Robert. Uh, thank you, yes, since uh, you mentioned OLAP, uh, what do you think about non-CPU execution resources? Like the CPU is kind of tapering off in frequency and even like core counts is more limits, uh, like GP, GPU, or even the CPU SIMD instructions. Um, uh, this is difficult. difficult. Uh, first, is there are different things. SIMD instructions, of course, we use ourselves too. Like if you use a uh, uh, use a scan on a table, we use SIMD instructions for, for filter, and so this is uh, regular uh, stuff. Now, uh, if you see asking about using GPUs for acceleration. Um, we tried this a few times, but we always had the problem is, I mean, if the data is larger than your GPU memory, which is usually the case, we have to transfer data in and out of the GPU. And this tends to ruin the performance advantage that you get from the GPU. It's not true for all cases. Sometimes it's still a win, but um, nevertheless, the gains were not uh, really impressive enough for us to, to do this in our main uh, system. So we had uh, some experience with this, but we don't use this uh, for a productive. All right, cool. That was a lot of great questions. Um, I guess my last question would be, um, you know, is Opera still Postgres compatible? And what is that level of compatibility? Is it is it just the SQL grammar, catalogs, other functionality? Like how compatible is, is it to Postgres? Uh, it's, it, first, it uses the same grammar, <laughs> so that's uh, uh, and it uses the same via protocol, so you can connect to, with the Postgres driver. And uh, now, if you talk about this uh, meta tables, so the 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 what are the courses? Uh, so catalog, this, PG catalog. Yeah, PG, yeah, PG catalog, PG catalog. I think PG catalog we expose and some other tables too, but of course these are fake. So we, we if you query them, you you get data that looks as you would expect it to get, but we don't expose everything. We only expose what we needed for some from some drivers. If you would have a need, of course we could add any table that, that you uh, what you need. But I think currently we expose only three or four tables. Got it, OK. All right, Robert, one last question. Oh, I only had one, sorry. Go for it. Are, are you all done? OK, all right. All right, so uh, I think we're done here. Thomas, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. This is, this is a fantastic stuff. Uh